Hi everyone, in this video we are going to talk about the hole in the ozone layer specifically over the Antarctic. So what I want you to do right now is try to put yourself in the scientist's mindset when they are first discovering this hole. They were trying to answer two questions because they were just so baffled. I mean it just didn't make any sense. How is it possible that this hole only exists over the South Pole? Why not the North Pole? Why is this only the South Pole? But second, which is probably the most baffling, how come this hole shows up in September and then takes off in November? So a big hole in September and by November all of a sudden the hole is filled with more ozone. How? How? Just how? And so the way they went about answering these questions is they tried to get more information about the South Pole or things that were specific and unique to the South Pole that maybe the North Pole didn't experience. So let's do this together. Let's try to talk about the South Pole and get a couple different very important facts down. So first things first. The South Pole is the coldest place on Earth. Coldest. Anywhere. Okay, and so its coldest number is about negative 90 degrees Celsius. Now, Celsius, that's not a number we normally use, so let's translate that. Negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, let's put this into perspective. In Austin, when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit, people freak out. They'll do whatever they can to stay inside, stay inside their building. They'll wear giant parkas, which for me, who's from Michigan, that's kind of comical, but I've only personally experienced something at about negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is cold. I don't want to be outside in negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't even imagine what negative 130 Fahrenheit would feel like, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Second thing we need to know about the South Pole, their winter exists from June to September. Now, their winter has something that's really, really cool because it is so cold. So they essentially have a vortex of very cold air. Okay, you can maybe think of it as wind, but I think of it as just a circle of very cold air. And now when this happens, they form these really awesome clouds. These clouds are called polar stratospheric clouds. Okay. They are unique and they are beautiful. I will show you a picture of them in just a second. But the reason I'm talking about these is because these polar stratospheric clouds are essentially just very, very thin clouds. Okay, very thin, nothing fancy about them, but they have tiny ice crystals on them just all over. They're formed just covered in tiny ice crystals. So before I draw a picture of that, let me show you what these look like in real life. So here's a picture of it where the bottom part, this is your tropospheric cloud. So it's just this top part here that's really our polar stratospheric clouds, but they're so beautiful. And when they, when they hit at the exact same time, when you get uh, gorgeous tropospheric clouds with the sun setting, oh, they can just be stunning. But here's actually my favorite picture. At this very top part, these are 100% water comp composed or uh, composition for polar stratospheric clouds. And they're just beautiful. Like look at those pinks and there's some blues. They're just so pretty. I just like them. Unfortunately, they also are kind of negative. They are not the best thing for our planet, especially in the South Pole. So here's a cloud. Okay, thin cloud has tiny ice crystals on it. There's my ice crystal. So here is what happens in the South Pole. They have two different molecules that are entirely harmless unless they interact with these specific clouds. So let's start off with looking at CLONO2. Now, when that comes here and it interacts with the outside of these tiny ice crystals, what happens is they break apart into HOCl. No big deal, that's a fine chemical, we have no problem with it. The same thing happens with HCl. It comes in, again, interacts with these ice crystals and breaks apart into chlorine gas. Both of these, fine in our stratosphere in the winter. No problems, I mean, absolutely no problems, they're good, no issues. Now let's move forward. So let's start looking at late September. So if you recall, late September is the end of winter for the South Pole. So what that means in your brain, this is what you're thinking, lots of sun. The sun's starting to show up, lots of sun. Okay, now we have a problem because when HOCl interacts with high energy UV radiation, it breaks apart to form a chlorine radical. Same thing with chlorine gas. It interacts with high energy UV radiation, breaks apart and forms the chlorine radical. These are bad for our ozone. We know this. When that chlorine radical comes in and interacts with ozone, it breaks apart ozone to form diatomic oxygen. Now, the really big problem is that chlorine mole or radical is then regenerated. And so it's consumed and it's regenerated. It's a catalyst. So one chlorine radical can actually destroy 100,000 ozone molecules. They're really, really bad. So in late September in the South Pole, 
all of a sudden we start to have a huge increase of our concentration of chlorine in our stratosphere. So that's a big problem. Now let's move forward. Now we move to early November. So in early November, November, two important things happen. The first thing is that our clouds start to dissipate. Okay, so it's not that cold. We don't have these huge vortex of cold air, so our clouds start to dissipate. So what you need to be thinking of, this halts the production of HOCl and chlorine gas, chlorine gas. So we're no longer producing these things that then decompose to create the chlorine radical. So that's step one, that's a really good thing. And the second thing, which is even better, is that the wind from our lower latitudes, from lower latitudes, okay, brings ozone to the South Pole. This is very important because as of late September when the sun shows up, we create these chlorine radicals, our ozone hole just increases, increases. It gets just bigger and bigger and bigger. By early November, the clouds start to dissipate, so we're no longer creating the um, chlorine radical, but we're also bringing in more ozone. So the ozone eventually reaches the hole and it starts to fill back in. So that's early November, which is awesome because by late November, by late November, most, I'm going to say most of the hole is filled. So it's good. But can you imagine being a scientist and seeing these measurements for a good two months and being like, what is happening? I don't understand. So essentially, it has to do with these gorgeous, gorgeous clouds that really destroy our environment. All right, so now let me ask you a question. This is what the scientists were trying to figure out. Why don't we have this problem in the North Pole? Okay, we know why it happens in the south. Why don't we have it in the north? Go. Did you get an answer? Hopefully you did. Essentially, it all comes down to the fact that the North Pole is not cold enough. That's really it. If the North Pole reached temperatures of negative 90 degrees Celsius, they would probably form these polar stratospheric clouds. They would probably have the reduction into all these awful chemicals, which then decompose to create these chlorine radicals, which then destroy the ozone, and then they would have a hole over the North Pole. But luckily for us, it's not cold enough. And so the North Pole simply does not have this problem because the temperature is warm enough. So now, let's go down just a little bit so I can show you a graph of this. Basically, all you need to see are the average temperatures here, this red line. And so we, for the Arctic, we just see that it only reaches temperatures of about negative 75 or so, negative 75 degrees Celsius, whereas the Arctic can reach all the way down to negative 90. Now, this difference of about 15 degrees Celsius is enough that our ozone is protected in the North Pole. So thank goodness for that. Take care of yourself, guys. Have a good week.